Revelation, Christ Triumphant. Hello, I'm Kendall Brian Hunter, and I'm author of this book, Consider My Servant Job, still on sale. Get a new after Christmas sale or New Year's sale. It's a great way to start the year. I realize we're going into the Book of Mormon, but you can get a head start. Everyone has difficulties. Well, it's good to see you. You're looking good, and I'm glad you came back to this, uh, my podcast or my uh, YouTube channel, whatever you want to choose to call it. So, Kendall Brian Hunter, author of that book, and this is Come Follow Me, Get to the Point, where I always show up. I always come prepared. We never take roll. This is casual. Never take roll. Let's bring your own refreshments. This is a meal replacement shake. You're probably going to need one after all that junk food they fed you over uh, Christmas and New Year's. The good news is, is once we get past New Year's, you have uh, New Year's Day, then get some more junk food at Valentine's Day. Things kind of ease off around St. Patrick's Day, and then we're back to normal. And then I have to wait a couple of months for uh, for Halloween to come around to get the junk food force feeding you. Oh, next year's a leap year. Keep that in mind. What are you going to do with that extra day of life? Um... Yeah, New Year's coming up. Get a pad. Just keep writing 2024 over and over again. And uh, do it about 15 times uh, over the next three days. And you won't make a mistake come January 1st. So we are now here to resume the apocalypse. And thank you for watching the videos. I know uh, this holidays are kind of hectic, and I try to keep this get to the point short and sweet and to the point. Not these two-hour podcasts where people drone on and they tell you every little fact they ever learned their entire life about the subject. No, I try to keep this uh, quick, and I'm really confident that you'll feel blessed with this approach to it where I keep things simple. So we are ending the book of Revelation the book of uh, the last book of the Bible, next year's Book of Mormon, which repeats some of the stuff. Uh, Nephi has an apocalyptic vision where he sees the same thing John does. He's just not allowed to write it because John was going to write it. And then we have the Joseph Smith translation corrections. So let me get back on it, uh, back on topic. Themes, chapters 15 and 16. Plagues are unleashed. These are the last great plagues that God pours out upon the earth. And it mentions two songs. One is the Song of Moses, which you can find in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32. It's the first few verses. The other one is the Song of the Lamb. And that is, you can read about that in section 84, verses 99 to 102. See, those are the songs we're going to be singing in heaven. And you also read about people playing harps in heaven. And this is where this comes from. Is that like, that's not something you see in the comics. It's actually a uh, doctrine found in the book of Revelation. Chapter 17. We're going through this kind of quick. We, uh, this is get to the point. <clears throat> you see an image of a woman, and she's a and it's a woman. This woman contrasts with the woman you saw in chapter twelve, which represents the church. This is the anti-church. It is a whore. She is sitting on a monster with a bunch of heads, and there was uh, she represents the false church as opposed to the true church, and that which you read about in chapter twelve. She's sometimes called the mother of harlots, and you have the uh, daughter churches are also harlots, and these are the uh, you have the great mother church and have these sub churches that are offsprings of her which are also false churches uh you got any questions about that um read first nephi chapter 14 verses 22 uh, chapter 14 and chapter 22 second nephi 10 and second nephi chapter 28 where nephi talks about this uh, woman this uh, mother of harlots the uh, daughter churches that we respect people. We have an article of faith to the effect that we allow people worship how, what, and whatever they want, whatever they may. Religious toleration has always been a big thing since uh, Nauvoo, where Joseph Smith passed laws. But this doesn't mean these other churches are the correct church. We always every church has points of exclusivity. Uh, there's always non-negotiable in whatever religion. So that's what John sees as this whore on it, and, and reminds you that yeah, there's. Uh, dangers with, with the doctrine and sometimes when you interact with people you can these things rub off things that aren't true and i've really seen with a lot of people who get really busy into c.s lewis and some of the quotes they say you know this doesn't square with the gospel but you're really emotionally attached to c.s lewis or whomever and uh, or dietrich bonhoeffer and we respect them uh we, we gather truth from them but if you're not careful you can get some wrong ideas from them chapter 18 and 19 this is what we've been waiting for. This is the fall of Babylon and rejoicing in heaven. 
it's two chapters kind of talking about the same thing, but they, they go into detail about the uh, merchants. And remember, the uh, we talked about the debanking with the Mark of the Beast. That's uh, a lot about having your banking cut off, not access to your money. And that's why they mentioned the merchants a lot, is that uh, the, the, the Beast controls banking and finances. And by putting the mark on, if you love the Beast, you get access to your banking. If you do not, you get cut off from your banking, and how soon the, before you starve, do you start saying, okay, I'm going to get the mark of the beast just so I can get food, get, get, get insulin for my daughter so she's not going into diabetic shock. Yeah, you need to think about these things. I'm not going to be your friend if I keep quiet about dangers. The doctor who doesn't tell you that you have cancer or you need to get a toe amputated the doctor is committing malpractice, and I'd be committing malpractice by not warning you about these type of things. But there is triumph in there. Chapter 20. The tide has turned. Everything has shifted. Chapter 20 talks about Satan being bound. It talks about the millennium, which you read more about in other places in the scripture. Now, this is an interesting thing. Satan's bound for a thousand years, but at the end of the thousand years, he's, he, he gets loosed for a small season. Uh, we don't know how long that's going to be. Uh, Joseph Fielding Smith speculated it was another thousand years. That speculation, and part of the reason is that Christ came in the meridian of time, so he had the 4,000 years before Christ. This would make 4,000 years. Um, this would be 4,000 years after Christ, so you have the 2,000 years and the uh, seventh year, and then you had an eighth one to balance things out. That speculation... Um, we'll get more information as we get closer to it. But the thing is, it is at the end of Satan is loose, he gathers his forces, and we have what's called the Battle of Gog and Magog. This uh, was prophesied about in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Uh, Joseph Smith, in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 280, said uh, the Battle of Gog and Magog happens at the end of the millennium. Now, this is separate from the Battle of Armageddon. Um, Elder McConkie, in his book, The Millennial Messiah, uh, kind of cheat who does things two ways. He says there's a first battle of Gog and Magog and a second battle, and there, there's probably some circumstances in which he's writing where he wrote things that way, because some people would confuse uh, Armageddon with Gog and Magog, but Joseph Smith said, no, they're, they're separate. The Armageddon is separate from Gog and Magog. So uh, that happens at the end. Why do we need to know about this? If it's really kind of outside our scope of life, uh, think about that. Why, why God's telling us stuff that doesn't seem to be really useful right now? So, chapter 21 and 22, the book of Revelation ends. So, the big thing with that is you see the New Jerusalem. And Ether talks about this in chapter 13, that New Jerusalem is on this, the American continent. And the interesting thing, this is interesting, it's a cubical city. It's shaped like a cube, but it's the same shape as the Holy of Holies in the, the tabernacle and in the ancient temple. The, uh, they're sort of the equivalent of the celestial room was a cube. And so the same thing with the New Jerusalem has that same shape where it's a nice equilateral balanced uh, balanced shape. Uh, cubes are symbolic of stability. Uh, circles are symbolic of eternity. You see these symbols, a square and a circle some, on some of the temples that uh, it, it's a joint symbol to remind us these two aspects of uh, stability and eternity. And this is about stability. So the cube is given in stadia which is an ancient way of measuring things. But in the uh, United States of America, it's 1,380 miles on each side. 1,380 miles on each side, or uh, 2.6 billion miles cubed when you do the math on it. That's a 10 billion cubic kilometers. That's a big city. There has gates on each side, and uh, this is where the righteous dwell. And like I said, it's, it's, it's a big thing if we're understanding this correctly. It's uh, kind of a, you know, some people compare it to the size of the moon. But, uh, you know, we have what we have. And uh, let's not fly off the handle if something seems really strange because it could actually work out. I mean, that'd be a lot of gravonic uh, gravity disruptions when you have something with that, that massive, with that much gravity. But then again, God's a God's of miracles. So that's it. That's the end of the book of Revelation. You have New Jerusalem, Christ and Heavenly Father comes down. They live on the planet. Uh, of course, in the Doctrine and Covenants, it talks about how the earth will become a crystal sphere and it's sanctified in a mortal state. It will be the celestial kingdom. And a sea of fire and glass, it's also heaven. 
So how do you feel about things now, now that we finish this, uh, these disasters upon disasters of just watching a nonstop horror movie running through an endless spook alley? How are you feeling about things, about God's triumph? So let's bring this to the Christ quotient in about 10 minutes. First of all, why does Heavenly Father want us to know about this stuff? Like I said, if, if this doesn't have any practical application, that doesn't help you balance your checkbook, why do we need to know about this stuff? And I'm not going to answer that question, just mull over that. Um, why does God need to send all these plagues and disasters to the planet? You know, isn't God a God of love? And I don't believe that a loving God would smite the earth with a bunch of uh, plagues and uh, disasters and earthquakes and have a, a meteor impact with wormwood. Well, what are you reading? Is this the reason why you don't read the scriptures? Because what you read in the scriptures is different from your personal convictions and your personal convictions slam up against reality like you're a crash test dummy and your head's on backwards and your arm's dislocated. Um, God's telling us stuff for a reason. And it's important enough that, that John got it and Nephi got it. And frankly, any member of the church can see the same vision if your uh, God needs to send it to you and uh, you're obedient enough. So how do these all these plagues and disaster fulfill uh, Heavenly Father's purpose? Um, if this stuff is scary, is going into denial uh, the correct response? Well, as I said, this is the Christ quotient. So as we read about these plagues in the book of Revelation, what do we learn about Christ? And secondly, what do we learn about Christian discipleship? Uh, you know, the role of the church in Christian discipleship. You know, what it means to have these beasts come up out of the water and out of the earth and uh, these, this false prophet, prophet that can work miracles that deceives people. You know, what does it mean to have the mark of the beast uh, contrasted with uh, 144,000 high priests? You know, if you're a high priest, uh, are you taking your office seriously? Are you just kind of being a uh, advanced elder? Uh, you got all the perkages, but you're still kind of dinking around with stuff in the church. Uh, what, what example are you setting to other people? What, what does Christian discipleship mean when, when you're going to have these disasters coming? And lastly, to wrap up everything, the book of Revelation, the message of the book is that Christ wins. And winning Christ, that's the point.